What I'm about to do is something that I, I, uh, I feel incredibly nervous about doing um, in front of my own engineering team, let alone in front of you guys, which is to talk about a bunch of stuff that's full of buzzwords. And so I want to preface it um, by saying that um, I don't trust any of these buzzwords. <laughs> and so please take everything I'm about to say as a grain of salt, or with a grain of salt, and uh, please um, listen to this from the perspective of me talking about an early POC, right? So don't, please don't misinterpret this section of the talk as being like me describing a huge shift in direction for Coho or anything like that, right? Our customers are NFS customers on VMware, but we've had this interesting you know, use case come up. It's a really good fit for what we've built, and we've been working with some customers around it. And so I thought it would be useful to describe it primarily because if any of the listeners um, have similar needs. Um, I would be interested in, in growing the set of prototype uh, customers that we're doing stuff with this on. So this is sort of a, a call to arms in a, in a certain sense, but I, I really, you know, I'm gonna say Docker, um, and I'm gonna say some stuff about analytics, and so it's gonna be really, really, you know, dangerously loaded as a, as a bunch of buzzwords. Um, so I wrote this uh, blog post about hyperconvergence being a lazy idea, um, and it really upset uh, a bunch of people. Um, I, I found this really, really, uh, uh, weird uh, in that my background as a, as a sort of academic is to say totally detestable but objective things all the time, right? It's, it's how we move forward with stuff. And uh, usually it leads to a big argument and, you know, some constructive stuff comes out of it. Um, this, this hyperconvergence blog post didn't have that result. It had a bunch of people jumping up and down screaming, you know, that this is FUD and stuff like that and very little back and forth on a, on a sort of discuss the thing. And so that's something that I hope um, changes. Right, that I, you know, when I say this stuff, I, I'm genuinely trying to have a discussion. Um, am I close to running out of time? You're no, dangerously I'm close. Listening. Okay. <laughs> um, so, the thing that I said in this article about hyperconvergence being lazy, right? And this is a super loaded word, and I think I shouldn't have used it. Um, but from a system design perspective, and not an administrative perspective, right? Administrators that are taking on hyperconverged systems are understandably being lazy in a good way. Right? But from a system design perspective, these flash devices are super capable, right? The hardware is super capable. And I worked with virtual machines for my entire graduate education, right? I wrote part of Zen. Um, you know, there are a bunch of wasteful aspects of hosting virtual machines, right? Virtual machines give you more resource density than physical servers, but they're just as idle, right? You've committed just as much RAM to them and they sit there doing nothing. And so if you're gonna take a fat server that you're paying licenses for that's full of VM RAM and stick a flash device on it that is as expensive or more expensive than the CPU, right, you're, you're arguably not doing the best job as a system designer, right? As an administrator, you're making a completely sensible decision, and I think that the hyperconverged thing makes loads of sense in small scale. I think that there's technical stuff that needs to be solved for the larger scale. Now, the way that I've described this graphically is when you buy a storage system, the workload is peaky as heck, right? Everybody knows this. When you buy the storage system, you buy for this, right? You have a peak demand problem, okay? So. This is something that, that we do a good job of because we, we address the aperture of access into the flash. We integrate with the network and the CPU to really expose the capabilities off the flash. The reason that I, with a strong background, I hope in virtualization, have chosen not to build a product that co-hosts virtual machines is that the virtual machines that drive this workload add to the peaks. Right? The CPU load involved in requesting that I.O. and processing that data is co-located in this graph with the peaks. And so, you're hurting yourself when you are down. Right? But that doesn't mean that there's not a huge opportunity for resource utilization and efficiency in these systems. Right? That, in fact, especially as you start to deploy CPU alongside Flash, you end up with a much more balanced system. And there's this white space in the back of this graph that is effectively wasted. Right? Hyperconvergence, by and large, doesn't help with this unless you have a workload that does I.O. and then does compute for a long time, and then does I.O. and does compute. So how can we fill this? You don't this think space? the like, FTL garbage collection and stuff like that could, ha could happen in that white space as, a, as sort of a complement, but it's not really the storage processing as much as the SSD there's, processing. There's, there's certainly an opportunity for background storage tasks in here. Yeah. Um, I think it's a bigger opportunity than, than just that. But that is actually, let me come back to that point. Um, so now let me shift and talk about two like, customers that, that we ended up talking to. Um, I think I have a little slide for this. 
Yeah, sprawl and withdrawal. Um, so, um, we've been working with, with Intel on this. We actually have a partnership um, with a bunch of groups at Intel, and we're actually doing a partnered POC uh, with a financial um, that I can't name yet. Um, not because I'm being sneaky, but because it's early in the POC. Um, the thing that the financial has seen is they have a really sophisticated IT group, they have a huge amount of enterprise storage, and they have a whole bunch of quants and traders that want to do analytics, right? whatever that is. And they're buying uh, Cloudera clusters in the environment. And so they have this central, well-managed storage infrastructure, and then they have these islands of Cloudera all over the organization in broom closets and under desks and stuff, and they see data being copied off this, analyzed here, results being copied back, right? From their perspective, this is terrifying. First of all, the spend on this is kind of unchecked. Second of all, they understand how safe this data is, they understand how to audit it, right? They understand provenance here. They don't understand exposure on these things, right? This is worrying, and it's inefficient because they're doing two data copies. Right, on this stuff. And so the thing that we kind of... Probably not legal. <laughs> well, inside the organization, I don't know. I can't speak to any of that. Um, the, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a fair point. Um, do I want to talk? The, the other customer that we have is a, is a large organization with a huge um, ISP sort of uh, presence. They have, at any given time, about 40K wired and 40K wireless users and manage on the neighborhood of, like I think, 200,000 email accounts in their system. Um, they have immense amounts of log, and they have very little capability to look at the log. They've looked at using some of the software as a service tools for doing log analysis, but those tools charge by volume, and they have so much volume that like it's it's prohibitive, and so um, they would like to you know be able to do some initial analysis of these logs, but they don't want to build a separate infrastructure for it. And so the observation here is that incorporating those tools into the storage framework is actually a good match, right? That in the time when you are not serving peak load that you can potentially allow the user to work with their data, right? They can push down operations onto it. And so the work that we're doing with Intel and this customer and with this other customer is to take Cloudera's CDH5 uh, package, put it down onto the storage, and integrate it. Now, there's a really weird thing about HDFS, which is the storage system that underlies Hadoop and Spark and a lot of these things, which is that it has a name node, they call it, and it has a bunch of chunk servers. And the um, well, data nodes, basically. And the clients kind of come in and they ask the name node where the data is, and then they go and fetch the data, right? It says it's on these three. And then they can schedule the jobs. The Coho system has a central notion of where all the data is placed and has a bunch of micro arrays to do the stuff. Um, storage vendors have talked about integrating with, uh, with some of these analytics tools in the past, but by and large, storage systems have been starved for CPU. We're not actually starved for CPU because we're provisioning for the flash. And so we've been doing an integration where we effectively tie these things together. Um, we ship that Cloudera install um, dockerized, right? So we deploy the Cloudera stack as dockerized tenants on top of our stack with integration on the network to put them on uh, isolated VX lines, right? So you can run more than one Docker clusters in a network isolated VX line alongside the storage but run the analytics in situ on the data in NFS. So that means you can copy the data into NFS, you can create a Hadoop cluster or a Spark cluster, you can do a bunch of analytics on your data, you can tear that thing down and access the data over NFS. So it's a converged analytics framework. Um, and it's been a really interesting work so far. We're, you know, we're, we're moving along with it. The environment is 20 servers, 40 gig interconnect instead of 10, um, two types of flash. So it's hybrid flash, flash, NVMe and SAS flash, um, and VLAN, VXLAN isolation, um, multiple isolated CDH5 tenants. Um, and so, like I said, we converged some of the storage path of this, which has ended up being really like kind of fast moving work, which has been rewarding to see. Um, there are a bunch of interesting challenges, right? Preserving topology awareness in an environment where these workloads, right, these, these uh, uh, parallel analytics frameworks want to have some degree of topology, right? They want to not send bulk data across Tor links. They want to keep compute inside the cluster. And if you opaquely virtualize them and throw away that topology, they will do really stupid things. And so preserving some of that 
um, sense is, is an important thing and it fits well with the existing sort of topology understanding we have in the system. Andy, real quick, so did you um, productize that for the customers or do you allow the customers to spin up their own Docker containers? And Let me come like back that? to that in a second. Okay. Right? We're shipping them for the, um, for the POC. We've been working with them on a package CDH5, but I will come back to the arbitrary Docker thing in a sec. Um, the stuff that I explained about understanding um, the workloads and the, and the contents of Flash, basically paging in and out Flash and also knowing based on that calendar view when the system is likely to be idle for a period of time, um, is something that we're working closely with to schedule these jobs in as least disruptive timeframes as possible, right? So we're trying to do some really clever stuff around getting utilization out of the system, not bringing in a huge you know, data set for Hadoop and running a bunch of stuff at 9 a.m. when your VDI customers come in, but instead paging out the contents of, of cached flash, doing the job, and then repopulating it after. Is, is this sort of thing, the analytics, something you can, you can interrupt and you know, start for a little bit and stop, start for a little yes. bit and stop? Okay. Yes. Um, it, that corner can be hard to turn if you're having to pull stuff in and out of disk, so yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there's sense to being careful with it. Um, now, if I generalize off of this, um, this is a workload that in the mid to large I see all the time, and this is like so general that it's probably in a databases textbook somewhere, right? The, you know, the thing that we see in medical imaging software companies, in you know, university IT groups looking at log files and financials is basically some variant of ingest a pile of data onto enterprise storage, have a bunch of VMs that immediately pull it off and do some downsampling and filtering on it, right? write it back to the enterprise storage in a smaller form, then have some other possibly the same or possibly a different set of VMs that do analysis on it and then do some action, right? The goal with the APIs that we're building and the embedding of these tools is to facilitate these workloads for more sophisticated environments, right? That, that it you know, isn't actually a big stretch to start to use some of these tools, right? These are just tools. And putting them on the storage and letting more sophisticated customers work with them is something that we've actually had a fair bit of interest from, from our existing customers. Um, we have it internally, right? So there are a bunch of things in the storage system as simple as posting performance numbers in the UI, right? Where you're looking at really high rate stream data, doing a bunch of sampling and analysis and reporting that, that we implemented that thing four different ways for four different roles in the stack. And now we're in the process of moving it back onto the subsystem that we built as kind of an integral part of what we do for storage. So there's, there's actually, these things have evolved to the point where there, there are software tools that are useful for building a storage system in the same way that LibC was useful for building a storage system, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. They're, they're really interesting and valuable resources. And so final point, I think, on this, is the way that we're using Docker. And I hope that this kind of helps you sort of kind of draw everything together in terms of, of where the stuff that we actually build is interesting, right? So NFS as a server is just an application, right? It's, it's like a web server or a mail server, right? Or whatever. The thing that we did in trying to scale NFS in the face of very fast flash devices and in the face of integrating with the network was to think about those two aspects of the IO subsystem from the perspective of an integrated cluster, right? And so I've built, my team has built an NFS server that is disaggregated and scalable. And it integrates in one direction with an SDN switch as effectively network clustered IO. Right, there are a bunch of APIs in here that let me share IP addresses, steer traffic, respond to load, right, stuff like that. Down below, these nodes have high performance flash devices on them and have an opt-in library based interface to those flash devices that is effectively storage clustered IO, right? I keep leaving my pens places. Yep. So 
this is kind of how we use Docker, right, internally. Right, so Docker is, you know, and maybe it's useful to, to kind of talk to that. It is a container package, right? It's a Trut. Um, you know, it's more sophisticated than Trut's have been in the past. Uh, it has good ties into C groups to do resource control and stuff like that. It is a really great tool, but it's a way of shipping a all-in piece of software, right? It's like static binaries, right? It's an all-in piece of software that you can deploy and manage. Um, and that tidy containerization means that it's incredibly effective at doing deployment at scale, right? It's why it's being used in AWS, and it's why it's being used in, in Google's environment internally, right? It's, it, it lets a developer build a complete image, right? So a complete, yeah. Is it on Docker Hub or anything like that? Can, can we pull copies of it and run it ourselves of your so, NFS? So the, the way to think about these two aspects of our system is that each of these as a Docker container benefits from a set of new APIs, kind of north and south, to make Docker less shared nothing than it is today, right? And so these applications that run in here can link the storage APIs and actually get a high performance storage stack that does things like replication, thin provisioning, like all of these data services where they're delegated the access to directly integrate and, and serve those things, right? So they get spectacular performance off of this stuff. But doesn't the NFS stack really exist between the SDN and the microarray? I mean, no. So the um, the NFS stack, the bit of it that's doing protocol processing yeah. is like any other application, okay. right? So it's it's basically linking two libraries, right? Yeah. The right way to think about this is this is a library and this is a library, yeah, okay. right? So the NFS stack is linking this network library that says, you know, we'd like to share an IP address across these and right. give us a bunch of load balancing services, and on the store side, it's linking you storage know, activity like, yeah. exactly. And so, so getting to the can I deploy arbitrary Docker stuff on this, I, I don't know where we will go with that. Um, I, I, I don't want to build science experimenty stuff, right? Uh, I, I want to build stuff that solves problems. Um, with the deployment of CDH5, which is packaged as a Docker container, uh, which is the Cloudera stack, um, rolling it out on our system has been very easy and integrating with it has been very effective. We are able to use it to implement storage services internally like, you know, going and doing log scanning or performance analysis, right? Eventually things like even defragmentation I think can be moved onto, onto that. It's neat to think about writing these storage functions in a high level, you know, parallel language on stuff. Um, you have to be careful the kind of containers or applications that are in them that we run on there. Because I think it was how it, uh, Ray mentioned earlier. <laughs> oh, oh, the steely oh. stare. Um, <laughs> the, the kind of analytics workloads that your customers are running at the moment are interruptible and yeah. so you can You're run actually them in. implementing storage management function and data management function through the Cloudera? We're, we're, we're looking at moving stuff onto it. We've got, done a bunch of prototyping. Um, so you've already done stuff today, more of a direct implementation within within yeah, the yeah, yeah. Stack, we built it without the stuff. But you're looking at trying to migrate yep. that stuff to uh, a Cloudera. Because the more that you can get, and it doesn't need to be Cloudera Analytics specifically, stack but in your yeah, exactly. high performance storage system operating at the same time. Okay. So for a bunch of these tasks, these languages end up being a lot better than C. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> and so so again, I I preface this by saying, you know, this was like buzzword bingo territory, and I really want to downplay what you take from this, right? The, the bit that I think is really interesting is that the software that we built is a nice match here, and it's proving to integrate well against Cloudera. Um, I can't say that that's going to be true for other applications, and I can't say that other applications are a good fit for this. We will have to get some experience with that. But it's, it's an area where, you know, certainly on the POC examples, it's been really fun. Right, it's been it's been neat to explore a much tighter integration between like customer visible visible applications and efficient systems than I was ever able to do building VMs. Right, then you know, with, with VMs you're always kind of decoupled from that tight integration, and this is kind of fun to uh, to work. So, with the Cloudera stack, I mean, who's implementing the HDFS? Is it the NFS level? Is that how this is playing out, or or is it somehow you integrating above the HDFS? We're doing protocol level integration with HDFS currently. So we we spot the wire protocol and and we're able to again use the SDN switch and a bunch of our policy to okay. to do stuff there. Um, there, there may be benefits to going to a deeper integration there, but HDFS is actually like a really good match. Like I said, it's the similar enough in, in terms of architecture that we don't actually have to dig into it. Too, we don't have that TCP problem that I described earlier where you're trying to find framing stuff. Is there any 
uh, connection between what you're doing then and those higher levels, let's say that sit on top of a dupe like yarn or spark or any of that kind of stuff, does that fit or is that so the CH5 stack includes all of that stuff and we are using you know various tools um, so in but, but you can make you can provide performance advantages to those higher things yes then. yes exactly okay. um, and in fact doing things like um, um, prefetching data right like so doing things like even simple things like you know you're going to run a job later right you can actually write a job to do your prefetching for your job Right to move stuff from disk to flash. Right, it's simple, simple stuff like that is kind of. Uh, and so this cluster, all this clustering, then scales right into yarn. Then yes, okay. Yes. And and that ends up being a, a very attractive fit for a lot of NFS style workloads. Right, like I want to go do this thing to all of my log files or all of my JPEGs or whatever. Right, um, there's there's a, a a bunch of stuff in there that I will hesitate to talk about, but it's pretty neat. Right? Um, some of the integrations between some of those things and like the NFS namespace, for example, are really fun to think about in terms of generative properties and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, anyways. How, how tightly coupled or abstracted are you from your actual switch layer? Let's say Open I flow. get a system three years from now, the switch that came with it died. <laughs> I love, I, this, is a, this is a wonderful question. Um, we thought that we would be on white box switches by now. Um, we've uh, played with a bunch of them. Um, many of them don't boot. Um, it is a little early in the days of, uh, of white box switching, um, and so there, the, like Intel's uh, Alta reference, uh, which a bunch of the vendors are now shipping, um, they, they just haven't got the software stood up quite enough. Um, but but let, let's say you are abstracted enough to say we are vendor A or or whoever, it dies, drop in a new one. Is it just going to work, or I would expect that um, that once we support multiple types of switches, that that will that will work. We we abstract that currently in the stack. Uh, we certainly obviously do drop-in replacements, Arista to Arista, um, and so uh, so yeah. That's I mean ideally we wouldn't sell the switch, right? Um, as as that stuff matures, I think we will ideally move toward partnerships where you know it's a software interface to whatever SDN switching you already own. Um, we are currently certainly seeing sales where the switch is used both for storage and for regular traffic. So we have the ability to you support that. Yeah. Okay. So so it's a common thing with some of our more mid size to turn off half the switch for storage and let them use that as a plain Arista. Okay. I think I'm done. You think you're done? You know I'm done. I think you must be soon. Yeah. I have two minutes. I, I timed that well. I think that's all I've got. So you know when you say you can't stress how much you want to downplay this, <laughs> that immediately says to us, "Oh yeah, <laughs> that's the interesting stuff." That's it. like I'm. I, I hope. I, like I'm really sincere about all the stuff that I say. I I, I, oh, I right. really am trying to downplay. I and I really am interested in talking to people who are interested in this kind of thing, right? So I, I'm talking about it much earlier than I would normally talk about stuff. And I have a pretty high pain threshold for talking about stuff early. Um, but this one is, you know, you know, fairly. Uh, I mean, we're doing work. We're working with a pair yeah. of customers on it. We're working with Intel. Um, but. Right, I, I don't want you to go off and go like, wow, co-host, now it's like yeah. super Docker fanboy, whatever. Like, the, it's not it's not the thing that, that I want out of this of this thing. Um, but but it's it's really interesting. I mean, I hope this containerized uh, stuff is successful um, because I think it it it's it's interesting in the distributed sense, and I think that it needs these types of, of facilities um, as as sort of like the next step in its evolution. So it's kind of fun. Okay, any other questions? Do you have any future plan to go towards NFS4 or SMB3 utilizing your micro? Yeah, I, so, and iSCSI, all of these things I thought we would be pulled toward earlier. Um, and with us, everything is prioritization. Um, and we just haven't had the market pull to, uh, that doesn't mean that it's not there. But for NFS, we're like, you know, being pretty successful and we're trying to fill out that use case. Um, I expect that um, V4 is primarily an off thing from our perspective because a lot of the PNFS end of things we get off the switch already. Um, and so that's, you know, a lot of the performance wins for V4 we've already achieved. Um, same thing with the VVOLs question, mm -hmm. right? That we're getting a lot of the value that the VVOLs already have on this. Um, so I'm not that eager to go and chase that one. Um, there's some super cool stuff in SMB3. Um, I have been looking for the customer at scale that wants to, you know, commit to a POC, right, that, that would force us to do it. I haven't found them. Um, you know, maybe we get that 
you get a bunch of the Vivol type stuff from what you do already. But when VMware finally ship Vivols and everybody is working to them and playing with them, what's your stance going to be then? As soon as I see, I, I, I want to be uh, as uh, as non-critical of the Vivol stuff as I as I can. Um, the the spec that has been written. No, don't um, hold back, please. <laughs> the spec that has been written is is very mixed in terms of present and future tense. Right, it's it's uh, entirely unclear. Right, and how much value there is, especially on the file side. Right, VBALS is a response to array vendors not being able to do, you know, what the file vendors were were doing, and so that is the like. There's a clear win on the block side. Um, there is a possible win on the SDN side of block in terms of things like uh, using FCOE. In that FCOE, so this is a really weird thing I would say, but FCOE frames such that I could possibly use the switch to more directly shuttle data to the hosts that have it. So there's some fun optimizations I could oh, do. Oh, so there. is that what you were referring to before when you were when you drew out the Ethernet frames and then the yeah. TCP stream yeah. above it? So if, if you put the addresses at the front of the Ethernet yeah. frames, right, the switch can help you more. Oh. Um, right, we still get a lot of value out of the switch, but there's a use case where potentially you yeah. can do some neat stuff. But you kind of need the microlun type stuff that Vivals has to. You don't see any advantage of Vivals uh, with respect to you know storage presenting its its data management capabilities to the system, that, so it can take advantage of it. I mean, I understand the block has. Uh, there's some limitations there, but uh, I mean, we're we're doing a lot of that stuff with uh, with tags and with the UI we have. The like, it's not something that we're getting a lot of customer pull for. Um, but I mean, we 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 listen really carefully, and if it ends up being, you know, a significant thing, we'll absolutely move toward it. Yeah. Um, I don't honestly have the sense that on the NFS side, there's nearly as much to take on in terms of implementing support for that as there is for the array vendors who are having to like fundamentally change addressing. Yeah. Right? and implement more than 16 snapshots. <laughs> <laughs>